Scripture reading this morning will be from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. Hebrews 10, 34 to 39. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Good morning. I want to start with an announcement real fast. Um, for our upcoming gospel meeting in just a couple of weeks, uh, there are packets on that back table and uh, they'll be given to you today. So at the end of our service, if I can have a couple of men just standing at the doors with those packets. Uh, inside those packets, you're going to have 10 postcards. Um, the first five are Corey Collins' bio, and we ask that you send those out to five uh, friends or five family members or five of your neighbors first, and then the week after that, you're going to send out the other five, which has the schedule for the gospel meeting. Um, each family is going to receive one packet, or each individual is going to receive one packet. So uh, we, we're using this as a way to be able to uh, let other people know about our gospel meeting, uh, and so we, we'd love to have a big crew here, and we'd love to I encourage Corey in whenever he gets here for our gospel meeting. If you have one of those handouts from the back table, you might see that it says Jacob Rutledge on it. Uh, I'm not Jacob Rutledge. I'm Parker. Um, Jacob is sick right now. And so I got a message from him last night saying, hey, just in case you might want to prepare a lesson, I'm feeling a little uh, sick right now. And I was like, well, you'll be better. And uh, this morning, uh, he sent me a text message really early saying, hey, man, I'm sorry I'm doing this to you, but I can't make it. So uh, this morning, uh, we're not going to be studying what's on your outline, uh, we'll, but we'll be studying uh, something different. If you notice these four pillars on our wall, one of them over here says practicing godliness. And we decided that as a congregation, Dripping Springs wants to be about these four pillars. And this morning, we're going to take a look in on practicing godliness. And we, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, uh, we see Paul's definition of godliness. It's love from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a sincere faith. And this morning, we're going to be talking about a sincere faith. As we begin, though, let's open with a word of prayer and transition into our message. Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we're so thankful that you've blessed us with this opportunity to come together and to assemble and to worship you. Father, help us to be of the same mind. Help us to open your word and see the truths that you've laid out for us. And help us to be the righteous ones who live by faith. Father, we love you and we're so thankful for your grace and for your mercy. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Jesus is coming. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. We don't know the year or the month. But we know that Jesus is coming. And he's going to see two groups of people. He's going to see the righteous ones who live by faith. And he's going to see the group who shrinks back. None of us here this morning want to be found in that group who shrinks back. We all want to be the righteous ones who are living by faith. But how do we do that? This morning, if you will, I encourage you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And this morning, we're going to study in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 34 through 35, and make sure that we are the righteous ones who are living by faith. Because God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith. Starting in verse 34, the text says, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners. And accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an abiding one. Our first point this morning is that God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because they know what they have in Christ. 
uh, Roland in our message before the Lord's Supper today talked about in Hebrews this idea of Jesus is better. And in the, in the book of Hebrews, everything is better. We have a better priesthood. We have a better covenant. And now we see that we have a better possession. And being Christians, we have hope in this better possession. This better possession is a dwelling place that is forever. And it's far better than the current world that we're living in today. And as we consider the text at this time, the people who were living during this time, economically it was very dangerous to be a Christian. But notice how they accepted their property being taken away from them. It says they accepted joyfully the seizure of their property. How do we get this same kind of mindset? How can we accept joyfully if someone were to come and take our property away from us? Well, number one, there was a change in their priorities. And they were thinking instead of the temporal, they were thinking in the eternal. Matthew chapter 6 verse 20 says, We have treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. And in Acts chapter 2, after the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 verse 45, the Christians were willingly giving away their possessions. They were sharing with one another because they all had something in common. They were looking forward to this better possession. They were not so caught up in the temporal, but they were starting to think in the eternal. Secondly, how do we get this attitude? We don't worry about what others think about us or what others say about us. Rather, we care about what God says about us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. When I think about someone who was doing the right thing and had people telling him he was doing the wrong thing, the first person that comes to my mind is Job. When you see the story of Job, and uh, Job had all these things taken away from him, and all of Job's friends were coming, and they were talking to him, and they were telling him that you're wrong, and that you're sinning, and that you need to get right with God. Job was telling him, no, I'm not. I am right with God. And we knew that whole time that he was right with God. Job didn't need to listen to his friends. He didn't need to care what his friends thought about him. But Job needed to think about what God thought about him. And we need to do the same. And third, we need to know what the better possession is and look forward to it constantly. You know, as we sing songs about heaven, they're some of our favorite songs. Because we look forward to that day where we get to be with one another and singing those songs with one another in the presence of our Creator. But there may be some of you out here this morning where it's hard to sing those songs because you're not sure if this is something you're going to experience. And if you're not sure that this is something you're going to experience, what can you do to be more confident that this is something that you will experience? We need to live by faith. God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because they know what they have in Christ. And these people in Hebrews, their faithfulness is shown by knowing what they had for themselves. They were holding on so tight to this promise that God had set before them that no matter what was going to happen to them, they were okay with it because they were looking forward to that better possession. This promise that has been given to them, it's better than anything that they've ever had before. It's not a fleeting rest or a small period of time that they were going to be safe. It was forever. And there's a great need of confidence. We look at their confidence and we need to apply the same kind of confidence to our lives today. Because I'll look at verse 35. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. See, they had confidence in what they had because they knew for a fact that they would receive this great reward. But there are things in this life that come in and really rock our world. Right? When something happens to our family... Isn't it hard to lose or to stay confident? When you find out that you've been diagnosed with cancer, isn't it hard to stay confident? Or when someone you love is diagnosed with dementia, isn't it hard to stay confident? See, when life throws us curveballs, it's hard to stay confident, but luckily we don't have to do this on our own. Because we have a helper. We have an advocate in Jesus. And we have the church. We have a way of encouragement. We can encourage one another. We can stick with each other. And know that we're never in this fight alone. You know when we think at faithfulness. We think we have to be absolutely perfect. But faithfulness doesn't mean that you don't have any doubts. 
Faithfulness means when you're at your lowest, you never give up. We need to always remember what we have in Christ because God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because we know what we have in Christ. Secondly, look at verse 36 with me. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Our second point this morning is God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because they have endurance. And we can look back at verse 32 and see that these people have already endured a lot. Look at verse 32. It says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict or suffering. See, Jewish men were attacking them because they had become Christians at this point. And for us today, just because we accept the teachings of Jesus and live our lives in a way where we're living for Him doesn't mean that we're never going to suffer. God doesn't just put a hedge around us when we become Christians that cause us to never experience any suffering at all. When we think about Christ himself in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, the Son of God, experienced temptation from Satan. See, we're so scared to suffer and endure the consequences, but God wants us to have endurance. God wants us when things come in and rock our world to stay confident in him and to endure through those things. Because he says, confidence is the will of God. If we have endurance, we are fulfilling the will of God in verse 36. So how do we endure? How do we do this? Well, no matter what you're going through in life, you hold on to Christ as tight as you can. Because we're going to face tough times. It's something that's just going to happen. But those who always continue to find a way to get through it are doing the will of God. And you think about crossing a street with a little kid. What's the first thing you do? You stick your hand out, right? You don't want them to go across that street alone. You're holding on to them very tight because you want to get them from point A to point B. We're holding on to Christ. We're letting Him help us cross the street and we're trusting in Him that He's going to get us there safely. When we think about endurance, endurance is a synonym for faithfulness. It means to hold fast, drawing near to God at all times. It's not just when you're doing good. It's not just when you're doing bad. But it's at all times we are drawing near to God. Because we understand that we're going to suffer. But it's not because of our sins. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7 uh, confirms this. It's for discipline why we suffer. Because when we suffer, we, be strong, we become stronger. It's when our faith is truly tested when we truly find out how we rank. When you think about the story of Job, we're introduced to Job, that Job was a blameless and upright man. He feared God and he turned away from evil. And as we see this scene of the angels of God appearing before God, we see that Satan is there with him. And Job says, or and the devil says, there's a reason that Job fears you. Because he has everything. You've given him everything. But if you give me one opportunity to come in and shake up his world, he'll truly curse you. So God says, okay, Satan, I'll give you this opportunity. You can test my servant Job. But he puts, a, he puts something on it. He says, you cannot touch him. So Satan goes and he, he does this to Job. Uh, he causes his family to die. He loses all of his livestock. Everything bad happens to Job. And what does Job do? Does Job fall and does he curse God? No. Job falls on his face and he worship his, worships God. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Satan's first attempt doesn't work. So we see another scene of the angels coming back and Satan appearing before God again. And and God said, Have you considered my servant Job? For he's a blameless and upright man. He fears God and he turns away from evil. And Satan says, Whatever, whatever. That, That first time didn't work. But if you let me touch him, trust me. I guarantee you that he will curse you. So God says, Okay, Satan, you can do this. You can touch him. But the only thing is, is you cannot kill him. And so Satan comes and he causes these sore boils to appear from Job's head all the way to the bottom of his feet. And Job is miserable. And Job is suffering. But does Job ever curse God? No. He doesn't. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Job shows great endurance through this entire process. He never turns his back on God. He always sticks true to God and knows that he is right with him. He continues doing the right things. And as a result, the Lord blesses him. Another lesson in this is we've got to stop giving Satan the credit that he wants. He wants us to think that he's in control. He wants us to think that he can do whatever he wants to our lives, but he can't. God has put limitations on Satan. When he appears before God and asks to do the things to Job, God says, no, you cannot do it to this extent. Two times. God is in control. We've got to stop thinking that Satan is the ruler of our lives because there's no way. God is the ruler of your life. And we have got to show confidence in God. And we've got to show endurance that when we're struggling, we know that we can hold on to God and He's going to get us through it. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm not Job though. I'm not a blameless and upright man. I, I don't always fear God and I don't always turn away from evil. There's no way God can use me, right? But guess what? Our God is a God of second chances. Our God can use broken men to accomplish great things in this world. When you think about God being a God of second chances, Moses killed a man and God gave him a second chance. David was an adulterer and a murderer and God gave him a second chance. Paul persecuted Christians and God gave him a second chance. Peter denied Christ not once, not twice, but three times and God gave him a second chance. So what makes you think he won't do the same for you? We have need of endurance and we've got to get back up on our feet when things knock us down. So what happens if we endure like we're supposed to? We'll look at the end of verse 36. It says, you may receive what was promised. And that thing promised to us in this chapter is this better possession and this eternal life. So it's absolutely worth it to endure whatever comes our way. Because when God makes promises, these are things that He cannot lie about. So we trust in them and we hold on to them and we don't give up. Because in the book of Hebrews alone, we look at all of the promises that God has made. And back in chapter 6, we look at the promise given to Abraham that God will bless him and multiply him. And that's what he does. And he promises us a better priesthood and that's exactly what he offers. He promises us a new covenant and blesses us with that new covenant. That the new covenant. And these are extremely strong motivators for us to stay faithful because God does not lie about his promise. And if we show endurance and we do the will of God, we may receive what was promised. But if you don't have endurance, look at what happens in verse 39. You are one who shrinks back to destruction. But we are not like that. God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because they know what they have in Christ. And God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith when we stick to his promises. And finally, look at verse 37 with me. It says, For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Our final point this morning, God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith because they are ready. When he comes, I want to be found faithful and ready. Don't you? But we have to know that he is coming. See, one of the greatest threats to Christians today is that we don't actually believe that Jesus is coming back. You know, we wake up every morning and we expect to do things the next week or the next month or the next year and we forget that Jesus could come at this very moment. We have to know that he is coming and that his coming will be without delay. Is your heart right with God? If he returned this very morning, where would you be spending your eternity? You know, Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor was coming down the aisle and he was punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his pocket to grab his ticket and he didn't see it there. So he reached down in his pants pocket and couldn't find it. Well, as that conductor got to him, he said, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I I know who you are. We all know who you are. We're sure you bought a ticket. You're okay. And he said, thank you. And so the conductor kept going. Well, as the conductor kept going, he was about to cross over into the next train. 
And he turned around and he saw Einstein was down on his hands and his knees looking everywhere for this ticket. So he runs back and he says, Dr. Einstein, I, don't worry, I know who you are. I am sure you bought a ticket. You don't need one. I, I'm, I'm positive that you got one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. But what I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, where are we going? Can you speak with confidence this morning that you will receive this better possession by God? Because God finds pleasure in the one who lives by faith and offers us this promise of eternity if we stick true to him. Verse 38, the text says, But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Do you know where you're going? For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has pleasure in him. Imagine God himself telling you this very morning that he has pleasure in you. Imagine God himself looking you in the eyes and saying, Your faith has brought me pleasure and I am proud of you for showing your faith. Can you imagine God telling you that this very morning? Or would he look at you and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This morning, is your heart right with God? Are you living your life by faith, knowing with great confidence that you will receive the reward that has been promised to us? Have you been washed in, by the blood of the Lamb? Have you put Christ on in baptism? Have you received the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? If not, I encourage you to do so this morning and to start your walk with Him, to start living your life by faith and start being confident that no matter what happens in this life, you can receive eternal life. You might be sitting here this morning, you might be struggling in your, in your life, in your walk with God, and you need prayers. You need to get back up on your feet, and you need to start living your life better, and you want encouragement. Come forward this morning, let us pray for you, and let us pray with you, and let us do whatever we can to help you. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and sing.